Okay, hello everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, today we're continuing with our study on this little book, More Than a Carpenter by Josh McDowell. This is part 12. I suspect that uh, this will be the conclusion. Uh, this is the final chapter uh, in the book. Uh, if, you, if you have not seen the the previous 11 videos that we we have on this I hope you will go back and watch it all from the beginning I, I think that this little booklet is or I guess it's bigger than a booklet It's 128 pages but it uh, it the information in it is so valuable so important so inspiring and I'm just so glad that we've done this study because it's been quite a while since I read the book and it just gets me all excited all over again uh, so uh, uh, we'll get started now, but first let me ask uh, these brothers here to say hi to everybody. I'm going to change the order today. I, I, I'm going to put all the pressure on Brother Ted. We're going to have him go first, and and uh, instead of Brother Joe always being on the spot for his, the first answer, okay? Uh, Brother Ted, go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, you've given enough hazing, you know, initiation to Joe. Now, now I get it all, huh? So, okay. Uh, my name's Brother Ted. Well, everybody else calls me Brother Ted. I don't call myself that, but Tedford, uh, and I'm here in Texas, and uh, the name of my channel, which Luke always has me say, is God's Truth Ministries, and I've got some just uh, a few teaching and edification videos on there just trying to get the gospel out and uh, keep it simple, keep it plain, and uh, encourage believers along the way, and I hope that's what this study does for you guys today. Uh, I think this is the final chapter in that uh, book, More Than a Carpenter, uh, which is uh, a real blessing. And as we've gone through these chapters, if, if you haven't watched the previous videos, I, I pray that you guys will do that and be blessed. Thanks. Back to you. Okay. Thank you very much. And, and uh, Brother Joe, please say hi. Yeah, this is Joe, and I have the Sebastian Dresden channel. Uh, my channel uh, doesn't focus on ministry as much as it does friendship. and and uh, just uh, learning and, and uh, uh, exploring things. So whether you're a Christian or not, uh, you're welcome to subscribe to my channel. And uh, um, I'm really looking forward to finishing the book up today. It's been a real interesting uh, study. And again, if you're interested in uh, getting this book, you can get it on uh, Kindle for a matter of a buck or two. And well worth it. Uh, and, or you can get an audio version from Amazon for, for slightly more. So I encourage you to, to get the book and check it out for yourself. Thanks. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Without further ado, let's just get started. Chapter 11, the title of this chapter is He Changed My Life. Uh, the, the, what I've been doing in this study is just reading a a paragraph or two normally and then then we all discuss it so I'll begin reading chapter 11 Jesus Christ is alive the fact that I'm alive and doing the things I do is evidence that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead Thomas Aquinas wrote quote there is within every soul a thirst for happiness and meaning unquote as a teenager, I wanted to be happy. There's nothing wrong with that. I wanted to be one of the happiest individuals in the entire world. I also wanted meaning in life. I wanted answers to questions. Who am I? Why in the world am I here? Where am I going? More than that, I wanted to be free. I wanted to be one of the freest individuals in the whole world. Free, freedom to me is not going out and doing what you want to do. Anyone can do that, and lots of people are doing it. Freedom is, quote, to, to have the power to do what you know you ought to do, unquote. Most people know what they ought to do, but they don't have the power to do it. They're in bondage. I guess I'll pause there for your thoughts. So we'll, we'll begin with Brother Brother Ted. Well, I think he's he's starting out, you know, right right where the rubber meets the road. I mean, people are looking for 
for true fulfillment in life. And if, if Jesus isn't alive, if the resurrection didn't happen, if he didn't, if he wasn't actually who he said he was, who he claimed to be, and all the promises that he uh, promised to give. I mean, here you're talking about a man in history who said, believe on me and I'll give you everlasting life. You know, come unto me, I'm the bread of life. Everybody who's, you know, hungry spiritually, deep in their soul. I, I'm the living water, he said. Uh, you know, anybody who thirsts, come unto me. Drink of the water of life freely. I mean, um, once again, like we've talked about before, these claims of Christ are just too outrageous to come from any normal human being. If they're not true, they're just outrageous, and, and he's unreliable. But uh, as, as the testimonies in the book are going to claim, and, and we can claim right here, I personally can claim, that the only true, true life, true living, uh, comes from Jesus Christ, the author of life, the author and finisher of our faith. Um, I know, speaking personally, I didn't have true life, uh, true fulfillment, true happiness, true, uh, true peace until I came to this, uh, this person that we're going to talk about. I'm sure it's going to get more into this chapter, so I'll, I'll go ahead and defer back to you, Luke. Thank you. All right, then. Uh, thank you, Brother, Brother Joe. Your thoughts so far? Yeah, this chapter uh, is, is uh, the chapter of the greatest miracles. Uh, the, the whole book is devoted to uh, an apologetics or approving of, of Scripture and the person of Christ. And uh, I think the greatest miracle and the greatest proof of, of Christ being who he said he was and, and uh, it, it, it'd be changed lives and you know the Pharisees after Christ had gone through Israel healing people by the thousands everyone who came to him uh, they uh, they came to him and they wanted him to do a trick prove you the Messiah you know make me a hamburger you know and uh, and he said a, a wicked and adulterous generation seek signs and wonders uh, and I think what he was trying to say is he was doing the signs. They were obvious. Uh, but the greatest sign is changed lives and, uh, in turn, a, a changed world. Uh, as, as we know, it. Uh, most societies are based upon what Christ said and, and what Christ did. Uh, in, a, in a micro look at things, we can see people who have accepted Christ and, and, uh, and see that they are a new creation. They, they do think differently. They, they usually live differently. Uh, they have a communion with God that's undeniable in most cases. Uh, and so that's what this chapter is devoted to. The greatest miracle of all is changed lives. Back to you, Luke. Hmm. Well, the, uh, these first two paragraphs uh, certainly remind me of uh, a time in my life where I had these kinds of questions uh, that, that Josh McDowell was uh, just stated that he had. Uh, it was in 1986, and I was 36 years old. Um, uh, my life was was pretty typical uh, for my generation. Uh, you know, I was working and pursuing you know success and. Um, my 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 life was also focused on, in my generations, what we always call sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and uh, my my viewpoint of what was right and what was wrong, and how we should be spending our time was absolutely different than it is today, uh, and it was pursuing just you know financial gain and and uh, uh, carnal pleasures. Um, but then something happened. Uh, in December of 1986, my mother died, and no one in my family up to that time had, had died yet. I never had, was faced with the loss of a loved one. Uh, and that was the shock, the, the kind of, sh my world was just shaken. Uh, and, and for the first time in my life, it, I got sobered. In my my mind, I thought, "What happens after we die? Uh, what's the purpose of life? 
is there really a God? If so, who is he? I had a, some background growing up in Roman Catholicism, but I also dabbled in all kinds of other things and spiritualism, and metaphysics, and, and um, Buddhism, and other, other things that I was curious about. Uh, but I think that what happened in my life I mean, is, is, is maybe uh, a turning point that is kind of the ne necessary for many people. Most people do not inquire about God and the afterlife. Um, if, if, if everything in their life is just hunky-dory, they, they think, why do I need God? I'm, I'm doing great without even ever spending a thought, a single thought on about God and the afterlife. So, but, but when something happens in your life, usually it's some kind of a, a dra dramatic thing, uh, tragic thing sometimes. It makes us ask these questions. Sometimes people never just voluntarily just get down on their knees and say, God, I want to know you if you're there. And, and what happens is they don't get on their knees until they're kind of knocked down onto their knees with tragedy. And that was my experience, and it sounds like Josh McDowell also had these kinds of questions. And what happened with me was I watched the movie Jesus of Nazareth because it was December. And that's the time of year they show all the Jesus movies. And I had seen it before, but this time in my life, it really had meaning to me. And after the movie, it, it ran the credits and it said, for more information, read the Bible. So uh, I had a Bible, and so I started reading it, and, and this, this is where I found the answers to all those questions, and I've never been the same since. Uh, let me read a little further and then get your, your thoughts again. And it said, uh, uh, he says, so I started looking for answers. It seems that almost everyone is into some sort of religion. So I, I did the obvious thing and took off for church. I must have found the wrong church though. Some of you know what I'm talking about. I felt worse inside than I did outside. I went in the morning and I went in the afternoon and I went in the evening. I'm always very practical and when something doesn't work I chuck it. I chucked religion. The only thing I've ever got out of religion was the 25 cents I put in the offering and the 35 cents I took out for a milkshake. And that's about all many people ever gain from religion. Your thoughts on that, Brother Ted? Well, yeah, and, uh, I, I, you know, we've heard it said, and I don't think we should use it as, as a canned approach or a canned answer or response, but, you know, Christianity, true Christianity, biblical Christianity, the way God intended it, isn't religion, uh, it's a relationship. And I know that's been used and overused and kind of ran into the ground, but it is true. And because um, the, the, the word religion has so many connotations, and usually religion, what it boils down to is, comparatively speaking, all the religions in the world are man's attempts, mankind's attempt to reach God or to attain some kind of a part of the divine or something that uh, that they can't have uh, in their own humanness or whatever, or to alleviate their own guilt or what have you. Uh, but uh, just like your uh, avatar, uh, Brother Luke, is, is true Christianity is God, a crucified Christ who came to earth reaching down to man not just reaching down, but coming down here as a human being. Like uh, I quoted Hebrews uh, yesterday, Jesus Christ, uh, so he could relate to us, he partook of the same. He became like his brethren, a partaker of flesh and blood. So uh, no other religion has that. So, uh, yeah, I agree with Josh McDowell that it's not religion that does anybody any good. It's the true relationship with the true Christ, uh, the true God who came down to us, and it's a relationship, uh, not a religion like everybody thinks of it. Back to you. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, Brother Joe, your thoughts, please. Yeah, uh, 
<clears throat> listening to uh, you and Ted, uh, yeah, I, I completely agree. Uh, Christianity is a relationship with with the Creator, uh, and uh, it's it's not so much a, a organization or, or institution that we need to join. And uh, churches often uh, bring more. Uh, darkness than light uh, with rules and legalisms and everything else, but it really is uh, a relationship with God based upon believing the gospel. And, you know, what we deal with today in our society are primarily two schools of thought, and it may not be true worldwide, but in our society uh, there's materialism, secularism, and then there's Christianity. And uh, in Christianity, there's lots of sex and lots of uh, lots of different divisions and and uh, lots of room for error. Uh, the simple gospel is is uh, uh, proclaimed in fewer and fewer churches anymore, and and we're we're dealing with that and also uh, trying to bring the gospel to people who no longer have faith that a God even exists. You know, uh, if you remember back to, uh, oh, what's the guy's name? Maslow. Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs. Uh, it starts out with uh, safety, and uh, I forget the five or six things, but I remember the capstone, the top of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you might say secular uh, reasoning, is self-actualization. And that's where most people stop is self-actualization. They, okay, uh, I can see me, I can feel me, I can touch me, and then they expand that to the things around them. And if they can't see it, they can't feel it, can't touch it, uh, it doesn't exist to them. And so a lot of people just erase the possibility of knowing God from their minds because they simply haven't heard the pure, simple gospel, the, the gospel that can be given in, in 30 seconds and, and change a person's life. And, uh, and that self-actualization will actually expand to one more level that the secularists don't realize exists, and that's the realization that there is a God, a creator, and a, a, a personal God that wants communion with his creation. And so uh, I hope people will take that next step from self-actualization to realizing that, that there is a spiritual dimension, there is a creator, there is a God who uh, came and revealed himself through Christ, and uh, we can know him. Uh, and that, of course, is what this chapter is devoted to, the greatest miracle, and that's changed lives. Back to you, Luke. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I also had this kind of an experience, and like Josh McDowell had here, where he said he, he went to church and then he chucked religion. Um, I remember when I was a young boy, I was probably 8 or 10 years old, and my father, we happened to be back in Texas visiting his family where he's from, and uh, while we were back there, he took me to church's family went to. It was not Roman Catholic as my mother's church was. It was uh, some other, maybe Methodist or something like that. Uh, but, you know, I, I was trying to behave as a young boy sitting there in church listening and then at the end of the, the message, the sermon, the pastor asked people to come forward and get saved. And no one came forward. And then he, he got quite angry. And he said, he says, I know there's lost people in here. And you're not coming forward to get saved. So I pray that the, the rest of today is the worst day of your life. And that kind of shocked me. That kind of turned me off on religion and so-called Christianity. And I, I felt a, a bias against it for, for, for many, many years because of, because of that experience. Um, but speaking of the religion, you know, how he's, he's uh, religion is, uh, uh, he's rejected religion. Well, the three of us, we've all re re rejected religion because as I define religion, 
a, a religion is simply a, a, a system of, of things that you're required to do in your attempt to earn approval from God. Um, but uh, all religions are the same. It doesn't matter whether it's uh, Buddhism or Hinduism or is Islam or New Age religions. They're all based upon the merit system and thinking that if you just succeed well enough in your spiritual life and you're practicing a religion, that maybe God will approve of you and you get to go to heaven. But uh, that's, that's not really what I would call Christianity. That, that's probably what we, we get in terms of, in America and much of it around the world, of Christendom or Christianity is, is, is commonly taught. But Christianity is, the, is what we find in the Bible, biblical Christianity. And it's not based upon um, salvation being earned by the thing, good things you do. The Christianity that we find in the Bible is based upon that uh, salvation is received because of the good things Jesus did on our behalf. He lived a perfect sinless life and we get credit for that. He died for our sins so we don't have to suffer for them. So uh, religion is based upon the things you do and Christianity is based upon the things that Christ has done for us. And so uh, it, it's, I know it's a cliche that they, when people say Christianity is not a religion, it's a personal relationship with Christ. But it may be a cliche, but I consider that to be very true and very important to understand. Uh, let me read a little further, and then we'll get your reaction again. It said, he says, uh, I began to wonder if prestige was the answer. Being a leader, accepting some cause, giving yourself to it, and being known might do it. In uh, the first university I attended, the student leaders held the purse strings and threw their weight around. So I ran for freshman class president and got elected. It was neat knowing everyone on campus, having everyone say, hi, Josh, making the decisions, spending the university's money, the students' money to get speakers I wanted. Uh, it was great, but, I, uh, but it, it wore off like everything else I had tried. I would wake up Monday morning, usually with a headache because of the night before, and my attitude was, well, here goes another five days. I endured Monday through Friday. Happiness revolved around three nights a week, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Then the vicious cycle began all over again. Oh, I fooled them in the, in the university. They thought I was one of the happy, happiest go lucky guys around. During the political campaigns, we used to the phrase, happiness is Josh. I threw more parties with student money than anyone else did, but they never realized my happiness was like so many other people's. It depended on my own circumstances. If things were going great for me, I was, I was great. When things would go lousy, I was lousy. Uh, I was like a boat out in the ocean being tossed back and forth by the waves, the circumstances. There is a biblical term to describe that type of living, hell. <laughs> but I couldn't find anyone living any other way, and I couldn't find anyone who could tell me how to live differently or give me the strength to do it. I had everyone telling me what I might, uh, what I ought to do, but none of them could give me the power to do it. I began to be frustrated. Brother Ted? Absolutely. And uh, how many how many people have had that that personal experience in one way or another? Um, I mean, I think it's 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 what's what God has uh, it's how God has designed man that man mankind without without the spirit of God uh, has that vacuum. Wasn't the uh, wasn't it the philosopher uh, Pascal who said? Uh, there's a God-shaped vacuum inside of every human being, and it uh, can only be filled by the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, I agree with that. Um, I think uh, everyone, every person who wants to be part of a cause, I, I think that's a need 
you know, inside of everybody. Um, people want to either, uh, you know, have a position, a position of, of prestige or something, uh, uh, to be, you know, esteemed in the eyes of others, to be valued in the eyes of others. I think that's all because of that, uh, that God-shaped vacuum inside every person. Uh, uh, everybody wants to kind of have some favor, you know, from somebody to be, you know, people call it peer pressure when you're younger. Oh, people think, oh, the problem is all the teens are under peer pressure. Well, I got, I got, a, I got a clue for you. Uh, you know, I got some news for you. Uh, peer pressure doesn't end, you know, once you graduate high school or to graduate college. I mean, it goes on, it goes on into the uh, academic, academia ranks, it goes on into the professional ranks. Uh, it, it's a need inside people to, to feel accepted, whether they want to admit it or even realize it or not. I think there's that need for acceptance unconditionally that, you know, will somebody love me? Will somebody favor me? Will somebody accept me for who I am and what I've done and how I'm uniquely made up as a person? my distinct uh, skills either that are naturally inherent to some people or that they develop over time and hone in on a certain skill or, or, or traits or whatever. Uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, there's, there's got to be politicians. Who, who would want to be a politician except, except somebody who's addicted to human approval, you know, addicted to acceptance, you know, or, or, or to be favored uh, by others? You know, so I think that's that's an, a need that everybody has as a result of the fall, because we no longer have the Holy Spirit of God living in us. Uh, you know, un until we do, until we accept Christ, and um, even once people accept Christ, if they don't understand the unconditional acceptance and love and favor, and the way they're esteemed and valued by God, just as Christians, in the Gospel of John, it says, those who believe on him are loved by the Father as much as the Father loves Christ. I mean, the most, the most even believers know that the Father loves them as much as he loves Christ? I don't think so. And I think people need to get that. That's why we talk a lot on, on these uh, uh, videos that we make about our identity in Christ. People need to know who they are as a child of God. And if they're not a child of God, if they haven't accepted Christ, I think they're going to continue to have that uh, that emptiness inside and that need to be part of a cause or, or acceptance in the eyes of their peers or in others. So, uh, you, you guys thoughts? I'm back back to you. All right, thank you, and, and Brother Joe, what are your thoughts? Well, I, everyone that I know is searching for happiness, right? Uh, and happiness is you know, from the root word happy, happening, what happens, circumstances. And uh, so uh, we all want to fulfill that void that, that Ted mentioned. We all do have a, a, a God-shaped void in our, in our uh, minds and our souls. All societies search for God or a God. <laughs> and one of the ways that we fill that void is with... Uh, base or temporary circumstance. That's why Christ said it's harder for a rich man to enter heaven than a poor man uh, because a, a rich man uh, has all of his needs met and uh, doesn't have that sense of need for finding God as his natural innate uh, uh, soul uh, directs him. Um, sometimes people wonder why suffering is allowed, why does God allow suffering and, and dire circumstances? Well, uh, it's because people often reach, look for God in the hardest of times. It's why the church grows greatest where there's persecution. It's why God allows tribulation in this life. Uh, Christ said the first thing he ever said uh, is he came for the those that are sick, afflicted, uh, uh, humbled. Uh, it's hard for someone that's full of pride or full of himself to see that God-shaped void that Ted mentioned. And so uh, they blinded themselves. And uh, uh, it's, it's no... I mean, it's a curse. It's a curse to have everything 
that you need uh, and and have no need to look for God. You, it, it's a self-blinding thing. And so, uh, luckily, I was a kid when I when I came to Christ. I came to Christ as a child. So uh, I, I'm one of the fortunate ones. I, I had not yet been uh, corrupted by so all the world has to offer. I wasn't yet under the influence of uh, base nature, sexual urge, desire for darkness. Um, and so I was a better man at age eight than, uh, than I am today, perhaps. But, uh, yeah, we... Uh, can you imagine today, if you are looking for God, if, there, if you are in, a, in a, a circumstance where you're seeking God and you don't know where to look, and opening the Bible seems to be, my gosh, you know, overwhelming. So you turn on a TV and you see a faith preacher <laughs> or uh, a hellfire brimstone yeller, or you go to your typical church and it's nothing more than uh, a community service organization. Uh, that void's not likely to be filled by anything except the simple gospel. And so uh, sometimes the only gospel that people will see is is us and so and that's another reason this book is so important and this this talk is so important is that some maybe one or two people uh, won't actually realize what the gospel is except through us and so uh, that's why we're called to, to to talk about things like this and to spread that simple gospel um, well I'm off in left field again back to you <laughs> well, left field is a very interesting place, I find, brother. So I, mean, I enjoyed uh, what you had to say. Uh, this, I think what Josh Modell is doing, I haven't read ahead to see where he's going, but I suspect what he's doing is he's listing the things that he was seeking in life to try to fill that void and give him the happiness he desired. And he tried religion and he tried popularity and uh, politics and partying and stuff and, and nothing satisfied him. And it reminds me of that book in the Bible called Ecclesiastes. Uh, recently I, I completed a, a study and teaching on it. Uh, that, uh, that study is uh, available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. So uh, I hope you will watch that. Yeah, that. That gives you the perspective that we're talking about here. King Solomon was the, the richest man in the world. He was considered to be the, most, the wisest. He had everything you'd th think, but he, would, he never was happy. He, 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 he realized everything he accomplished, um, the marriages, the, the, the uh, acquisitions, uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the acclaim as the wisest man in the world, none of these things actually gave him happiness. And the conclusion, of course, the book is that the only thing that's really going to give you satisfaction in life and, and that real happiness and joy that we all want is a relationship with God because that's the reason God made us is for this relationship. I'll read further. Uh, I suspect that few people in the universities and colleges of this country were more sincere in trying to find meaning, truth, and purpose to life than I was. I hadn't found it yet, but I didn't realize that at first. In and around the university, I noticed a small group of people, uh, eight students and two faculty members, and there was something different about their lives. They seemed to know why they believed what they believed. Uh, I like to be around people like that. I don't care if they don't agree with me. Some of my closest friends are opposed to some things I believe, but I admire a man or woman with conviction. Uh, I don't meet many, but I admire them when I meet them. That's why I sometimes feel more at home with some radical leaders than I do with many Christians. Some of the Christians I meet are so wishy-washy that I wonder if maybe 50% of them are masquerading as Christians. But the people in this small group seemed to know uh, where they were going. That's unusual among university students. 
the people I began to notice, I, I didn't just talk about, uh, the people I began to notice didn't just talk about love. They got involved. They seemed to be riding above the circumstances of university life. It appeared that everybody else was under a pile. One important thing I noticed was that uh, they seemed to have a happiness, a, a state of mind not dependent on circumstances. They appeared to possess an inner, constant source of joy. They were disgustingly happy. They had something I didn't have. <laughs> Brother Ted? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, what he's talking about there is that, uh, you know, that there was a genuineness in those believers. Uh, that's, I'm sure that's what he saw, in, you know, intuitively without even having to really think about it. And, uh, you know, we, the way you started out that section uh, of the paragraphs you're reading now, uh, that m most people are sincerely seeking uh, something, some kind of attainment. I, I mean, that, uh, quite frankly, that's the reason, uh, you know, I, I think we have all these uh, secular uh, leftists and, uh, you know, what's called social justice warriors out nowadays is because if you reject God and you reject uh, his basis and his principles and his very life that Christ is offering us uh, as the means of, uh, you know, having meaning and purpose to life, you got to have something. You know, that's why I think people inherently are sincerely seeking some kind of contentment or some kind of some kind of cause, you know, something to be a part of, you know, and uh you know, that their, their inner heart, you know, God has set eternity in everybody's heart, you know, and we're all empty uh, until we have Christ. And I think that that emptiness, people are trying to fill it, of course, with, you know, uh, drugs and alcohol. I know we're getting back to a little bit, something earlier in the chapter, but I mean, uh, drugs and alcohol, I mean, what is that? I mean, what is the, the feeling that drugs and alcohol give people? Uh, it, it's a substitute for the Holy Spirit. You know, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is, Love, joy, peace. Uh, you know what? What did what do drugs and things like that do? They give people a sense of, of peacefulness, calmness, uh, euphoria. You know that's not the joy of the Holy Spirit, but they these are all substitutes. And of course, Satan is the the master counterfeiter. So I think those are things he offers people, and the whole world system offers people. Uh, you know, it's a substitute for God, a substitute for the Holy Spirit, but. Uh, those believers that Josh McDowell met on campus, uh, they found the genuine, sounds like. Uh, they knew what they believed, why they believed it, and they knew the God that they believed in. And, and McDowell, uh, Josh McDowell saw that, and there was some genuineness that he saw, and I think that's what uh, probably, uh, as you're going to probably read further, attracted him to, uh, to what they were all about. Um, so back to you. All right, thank you. Uh, Brother Joe? Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I don't know why things come to my mind the way they do, a little off center, but they always seem to be a little off. But, you know, just going on what Ted said, the place where uh, Christ is most heartily and, and readily accepted uh, are areas where uh, you would think it would be least likely. You know, here in America, we have the opportunity to give the simple, pure gospel and and uh, and expound on it and and uh, and and talk to people at every opportunity. But you look in places like China and the old Soviet Union and uh, and so many places around the world where the the church is persecuted, where Christians are persecuted, and you would think that that would be the last place. That, that Christ would explode or, or the the gospel would explode and yet that's exactly what always seems to happen uh, under when all of the all of the circumstance is ripped away and you know there's this our base nature uh, is left with very little to comfort itself that God-shaped void Ted mentioned is is exposed you, people see clearly, and and there's a there's a, a, a ability to see the spirit so clearly when all of the other stuff 
is taken away. That's what why Christ came to the, those who were humbled and sick and in need uh, first, because they were the ones who saw their needs. And sometimes the alcohol, the drugs, the pornography, the, the uh, dating, uh, the fast cars and nice homes uh, hide that void that's in our soul that God put there so that we would search him out. And, uh, you know, I, I just think that uh, sometimes the very best thing that can happen to someone is uh, tribulation or trouble because they, they, they tear away all of these things that distract us from what's really important. You know, uh, when we're on our deathbed, you know, so many times it's been said, uh, we're not going to be thinking back on, you know, how nice our car was or how many uh, really nice, nice nights we had with how many women or any of that stuff. We're going to be uh, thinking about relationships and relationship with God. And uh, I, I think sometimes people need to be in a place where they can see clearly their need for God. And the gospel is, is uh, easier to understand and, and uh, the pride is out of the way. And people can, can actually hear God calling a little clearer. So, yeah, uh, what Josh is talking about here is, is that clear sight that he had when he, was, when he put aside all the things he mentioned earlier in the chapter and, uh, and saw these people who had found what's really important in life, and, and he sensed that, like so many people do, uh, luckily. Okay, back to you. Hmm. All right, thanks. Uh, well, the last couple of paragraphs, the one thing that kind of stood out to me well, more than everything else was this statement. He, he says, but the people in this small group seem to know where they were going. That's unusual among university students. Well, I think that's unusual among people as a whole. Um, and that gets back to the questions I was asking uh, 30 years ago. Where am I going to go? What happens after I die? And uh, the th many times it's very common for people to greet you, say, hey, how you doing? How have you been? And my, my standard answer is uh, I'm fantastic. I'm 9.6 on a scale of 1 to 10. I mean, I've said it thousands of times. And um, sometimes people, they don't, they kind of ignore it. And other people, if they've heard me say it a few times, they finally inquire, why, why do you always say that? Why do you always say you're fantastic? And 9.6, well, why aren't you 10.0 instead of 9.6? And it gives me an opportunity to tell them that, uh, uh, well, I can't be 10.0 until I'm actually with God in, in eternity in heaven. That's perfection. That's perfect joy and happiness. But I'm pretty darn close because 9.60, I'm, I'm so happy because I'm promised I'm going to go to heaven. I know where I'm going to go. I don't have to worry about it. And, you know, people buy all kinds of insurance to alleviate any worries. You know, we worried about uh, health. Can we pay the medical bills? We buy health insurance. We, we worried about uh, financial security, you know, and leaving something for our loved ones, when, and we buy life insurance, and it take, takes away our worry. We have security, and we have assurance that everything's going to be okay, and that's, that's what I have as a, as a Christian. I know where I'm going, and uh, it's a, uh, so it's kind of like eternal life insurance. Uh, I'm promised by Jesus Christ I'm going to go to heaven, and that is the most comforting thing you'll ever you'll ever have. Um, I'll read a little bit more. Um, they had something I didn't have, like the average student. When somebody had something I didn't have, I wanted it. That's why they have to lock up bicycles in colleges. If education were really the answer. 
the university would probably be the most morally upright society in existence, but it's not. So I decided to make friends with those intriguing people. Two weeks after that decision, we were all sitting around a table in the student union, six students and two faculty members. The conversation started to get around to God. If you're an insecure person and a conversation centers on God, you tend to put on a big front. Uh, every campus or community has a big mouth. A guy who says, uh, Christianity, <laughs> uh, that's for the weaklings. It's not intellectual. Usually the bigger the mouth, the bigger the vacuum. Uh, they, were, they were bothering me. So finally, I looked over at one of the students, a good-looking woman. I used to think all Christians were ugly. And I leaned back in my chair because I didn't want the others to think I was interested. And I said, tell me, what changed your lives? Why are your lives so different from the other students, the leaders on campus, the professors? Why? That young woman must have had a lot of conviction. She looked me straight in the eye, no smile, and said two words I never thought I'd hear as part of a solution in a university. She said, Jesus Christ. I said, oh, for God's sake, don't give me that garbage. I'm fed up with religions. I'm fed up with the church. I'm fed up with the Bible. Don't give me that garbage about religion. She shot back, Mister, I didn't say religion. I said, Jesus Christ. She pointed out something I'd never known before. Christianity is not a religion. Religion is humans trying to work their way to God through good works. Christianity is God coming to man and women through Jesus Christ, offering them a relationship with himself. I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and get your thoughts here. Brother Ted? Yeah, I think now we're getting to the real specifics of things, you know, and uh, all the things the world has to offer, as I was saying uh, last last time, uh, just, you know, they are substitutes, and, you know, when you're having a roundtable conversation like that, that, that Josh is uh, giving the account of there, um, you know, it, it happens all over the place, and uh, the reason, you know, the God thing is mocked is because uh, when people just hear God, it, it, it's so unspecified, you know, it's not specific at all, and, uh, but the the, the lady, the girl there uh, in the student group there that uh, was absolutely uh, firm in her convictions says, no, you know, in, in essence, she said, let's get specific. And she just says two words, Jesus Christ, you know. And uh, I, I think that is the best approach we can take uh, that, you know, what makes the difference? It's not it's not a relationship with God because, you know, Muslims think they have that. Uh, uh, you know, other religions think they have that, and, uh, you know, uh, Judaism, what have you, but uh, the person of Christ, Jesus Christ, is what really separates him, you know, from all others. Um, you know, I've heard before, why do people use Jesus Christ as a swear word, you know? Uh, why is why is he so divisive? Because Because he is who he is, and he's the real deal. He's the thing that really changes people, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to you reading further because uh, one thing, I don't have much else to say on this, but I want to hear what's said further in that conversation about Jesus Christ being the difference maker because he, he really is. Uh, back to you. All right. Thanks. Yeah, that was an interesting point about the swear word because uh, uh, I hear people quite often, no, most of my friends, if they know me, they even if they're not a believer, they re respect me enough to not use Jesus Christ's name in that way. But, but you know, when I meet other people or I'm around other people I don't know, you know, it's not uncommon for them to say Jesus Christ in, in, a, in a way that it's not re revering him. It's just using his name as, as you would any other way of, of uh, expressing anger, disgust, or disdain or something. And, and uh, But it's interesting that no one ever says, oh, Buddha, Buddha, Buddha that, or Muhammad, you know. I don't, I don't know why, how that came about, 
but it, it is an interesting phenomenon. But uh, we are getting off a little bit, but Brother Joe, what are your thoughts? Well, <clears throat> as often happens, uh, I'll key in on one thing that's said, uh, and, to, and, and it colors all my thoughts for the rest of the, the conversation. And, uh, and it's no different today with uh, Ted mentioning uh, the God-shaped void that's in people's lives. And, you know, in college and university, uh, they don't, everyone's looking for fulfillment. And in colleges and universities and uh, in life in general, people will try to teach you things to make you feel fulfilled. And whether it's, it's Nietzsche, uh, who's... Uh, you know, the philosophical motives for life, uh, that they look for followers and uh, esteem, or it's Freud, who thinks everything revolves around sex and base nature, or Marx, who's everything's political, everything's about uh, power and empowerment. You, you can't teach Christ. You know, people go to churches and, and they try to instruct you in the ways of God. They try to teach you about Christ. And uh, it's all foreign to, to fill in that void. Uh, I guess the one thing that comes to mind is that God or the gospel cannot be taught. Uh, Christ must be introduced. And, and the way he does that is through those who know him already and his spirit. And so uh, just from what, he, what Josh McDowell is saying here in university, uh, Christ can't be taught. He has to be introduced. And, and we're the vehicles he's, he's chosen for that task. Back to you, Luke. Hmm. That was a, a very good way of expressing it, um, introducing people to Jesus. Uh, I, I, I've said before that you know I can't ever make anybody believe, and, and a lot of people uh, I've met on on YouTube, you know they, they take their evangelism very seriously, and they feel that it is uh, their they get very frustrated at, at, at their apparent failures to convert people, and, and I, I think it's important for people to understand that we cannot ever make anybody believe. All we can do is be ready with an answer, be willing to uh, introduce them to Jesus, answer their questions, and uh, and then it's between them and Jesus what happens. And then once they believe in Jesus, then it's between them and the Holy Spirit to see how their lives change as a result. Um, so, yeah, we just need to introduce as many people as we possibly can to Jesus. And, I'll, I'll read on. It says, there are probably more people in universities with misconceptions about Christianity than anywhere else in the world. Recently, I met a teaching assistant who remarked in a graduate seminar that anyone who walks into a church becomes a Christian. I replied, does walking into a garage make you a car? <laughs> there is no correlation. A Christian is somebody who puts his trust in Christ. My new friends challenged me intellectually to examine the claims that Jesus Christ is God's Son, that taking on, uh, that taking on human flesh, he lived among real men and women and died on the cross for the sins of mankind, that he is buried and rose, uh, he arose three days later and could change a person's life in the 20th century. I thought this was a farce. In fact, I thought most Christians were walking idiots. I'd met some. I used to wait for a Christian to speak up in the classroom so I could tear him or her up one side and down the other and beat the insecure professor to the punch. I imagined that if a Christian had a brain cell, it would die of loneliness. I didn't know any better. But those people challenged me over and over. Finally, I accepted their challenge. But I did it out of pride to refute them. But I didn't know there were facts. I didn't know there was evidence that a person could evaluate. 
Finally, my mind came to the conclusion that Jesus Christ must have been who he claimed to be. In fact, the background of my first two books was my setting out to refute Christianity. When I couldn't, I ended up becoming a Christian. I have now spent 13 years documenting why I believe that faith in Jesus Christ is intellectually feasible. Of course, 13 years, that was many years ago. I'm sure he spent probably 40 years now doing that. Uh, Brother Ted? Uh, I'm sorry, Luke, but I'm going to have to defer to you guys. I just had a call about some of the issues I had earlier. Uh, I'm going to defer over to uh, you and Joe for that, that paragraph. Thank you. All right, then, Joe, please. Yeah, you know, what, what comes to mind is uh, you can't argue someone into a relationship with Christ, uh, but you can often challenge someone to examine the evidence and and thereby open them themselves to to a relationship with Christ uh, I, I don't know how much you guys have dealt with uh, non-believers I mean I more than than I have I'm sure but uh, arguments never go anywhere uh, it's a, it's a fruitless effort and I, I think that uh, you know being ready with an answer is, is certainly biblical an answer comes from those who have a question, and and so uh, most often I find that that Christians on um, YouTube especially uh, often try to argue people into the kingdom. If I say this, you can't counter it, and therefore you'll have to see the truth. Uh, it never works. I mean, I, maybe it does, and I haven't seen it. Uh, it, has, it hasn't worked for me. But you can challenge people. Challenge people with truth. You know, uh, people do want to have truth in, in many instances. And, and if you can just challenge them uh, to examine the evidence, that's often something that will work. And, you know, that's when you do need to have an answer for the questions uh, that, that arise. But, but it's not going to be through argument. It's going to have to be through, through challenge. Uh, and... Uh, God will have to uh, put that in their hearts to pick that that uh, glove up that you've just set down and and, uh, and, and walk with it. But uh, there's certainly a, a lot of people that do a lot of arguing and not very many people who, in good faith, challenge someone to examine the evidence, as this book has done. Back to you. Mm. Well, I've had a lot of experience uh, uh, dialoguing with people. Uh, sometimes it's arguing. If it turns into arguing, when I say there's t different kinds of arguments, you, you can argue as you would in a in a debate or a courtroom where you're uh, you're presenting ideas back and forth for consideration and and uh, trying to prove your side. But uh, then there's also arguing that we think of it in a negative connotation where people are getting angry and, and raising their voice and, and resorting to personal attacks and that kind of arguing is not beneficial at all but if, if a person is willing to say well I, I, I can't, don't believe in Jesus because of this or that or and, and if the scripture does tell us study show yourself approved and be ready with an answer for these people and I think that that is our responsibility of all of us who put our faith in the Savior we should be able to defend our faith, as the scripture says. Now, what, uh, where I see the, the problem with a lot of Christians, as I said earlier, some people uh, take it too, uh, too seriously, the, the, uh, the challenge of converting someone. Uh, I've, had, I've had people say to me, from my street preaching or my YouTube videos, They'll say, do you, do you ever have any success? <laughs> Every single time I've ever talked to somebody about Jesus, I've had it successful. I mean, maybe they weren't one alert to Jesus that time, but at least they learned something. Uh, there's, you know, scriptures tells us that sometimes you plant, sometimes you water, sometimes there's a harvest. 
uh, I think that uh, we need to realize that uh, it's the burden is not on us to make someone believe, uh, but we do have a responsibility to spread the seeds. And, and, and then if we spread enough seeds, uh, you'll find that some of these spring, spring, seeds will spring to life. Um, Brother Ted, are you ready to talk again yet or not? Sure, I would agree with what you're saying there, brother. Uh, and it's hard, uh, at least in my my personal case, to to not think of success as you know, uh, you know what we call you know convincing somebody, uh, you know. But we have to look at this through God's eyes, and I think you're right. Um, you know, uh, sometimes you know it really is basically just our job to uh, to spread the word. Uh, you know, the, the euphemism in the scriptures is uh, you know. Uh, uh, plant the seeds, scatter the seeds, and uh, however it's received, you know, is up to the person, and it's up to God to work on their hearts, you know, if they'll let them. Um, I heard an expression a long time ago when I first got saved about uh, what we should expect when we're, you know, sharing the word, sharing the gospel with people, and uh, and that was some good advice, and I've never forgot it. Uh, and that is, don't tug on green fruit, <laughs> you know. Uh, some, you know, if you went up to an apple tree, or, or like I was familiar with in, in South Texas when I, when I was a young kid, and my dad had some orange orchards that, that he owned, and uh, go out there and, you know, you wouldn't pick, you wouldn't pick the green oranges. You know, they're not ready. You know, and some people are not ready. You know, it's just the, the, the point they are in life. And God, I don't believe is going to let anybody die that he you know, at 16 that he foreknew uh, that they would be much more likely in life to accept him at 60, you know. So even though it's hard to uh, not want to be convincing and, and uh, can have convincing arguments and represent uh, all the foundations of the faith properly and all that, it's uh, the final result is up to God and up to the person to accept him and uh, we need to we need to take as I'm guilty of this big time, but we need to take that burden off of us and uh, just rely on what the word can do in that person's heart if if they'll let it. So that that was a good word coming from you, Liv. Thank you. Back to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I don't re I, I I don't remember if I'm gone out of order or something. Uh, Joe, if it's your turn to comment, go ahead and say something. Otherwise, I'll read on. Uh, read on. Okay. Um, at that time, though, I had quite a problem. My mind told me all this was true, but my will was pulling me in another direction. I discovered that becoming a Christian was rather ego-shattering. Jesus Christ made a direct challenge to my will to trust him. Let me paraphrase him. Look, I have been standing at the door and I am constantly knocking. If anyone hears me calling him and opens the door, I will come in. That's Revelations 3.20. I didn't care if he did walk on water or turn water into wine. I didn't want any party pooper around. I couldn't think of a faster way to ruin a good time. So here was my mind telling me Christianity was true and my will was somewhere else. That's an interesting point. Uh, Brother Joe, why don't you respond first to that? Yeah, uh, it goes against our, our fallen nature to uh, give up self-determination and, and, uh, and rely on God. It, it's, it's an unnatural act to uh, not be proud and to humble ourselves and uh, bow the knee before uh, a God. Uh, our God, Creator. Uh, it, it goes against everything our fallen nature uh, it screams out. So, uh, yeah, that, that's all that's coming to mind right now, Luke. All right, thanks. Uh, Brother, Brother Ted? Well, just in regards to that, I uh, just agree with what Joe said there. It's, it's, that's why I believe the, uh, the Lordship Salvation Movement uh, is uh, has done a real disservice. It's it's. Uh, I, I think most people who get into the Lordship Salvation movement or 
follow the, the, the voices that are the biggest proponents of that. Like in my case, I'll just say right off that uh, I was saved by grace and then I got uh, Galatianized under guys like John MacArthur. Uh, you know, I think what, that's what happened is, is a lot of people hear the simple gospel, get saved, uh, believe it as a free gift, and then they get under performance-based Christianity. They get under the law in some way. They get under lordship salvation teaching. And uh, Unfortunately, the people that uh, were brought up in churches uh, that are lordship salvation that uh, confuse, and I think the whole basis of the whole deal about that is they're confusing salvation with discipleship. Um, uh, people need to be told that they can have the free gift by believing on Jesus Christ as the Son of God, believing that He's the one to give eternal life. Discipleship and straightening out their li straightening out their life and bearing fruit and, and and cutting out certain sins from their life that are that are debilitating, counterproductive, and just flat out wrong in society. <laughs> that comes after salvation. I, I love uh, and I need to get this book and maybe I'll share it with you guys when we when I get it. Is uh, there's a book by Bob Christopher, uh, who uh, is uh, from uh, People to People Ministries. It's now called BasicGospel.com. But uh, People to People, of course, was was founded by uh, Bob George and his staff. Bob George, the writer of classic Christianity, one of the greatest free grace uh, teachers ever, ever. Uh, classic Christi classic Christianity being one of the best books about free gate, free grace, and the offer of eternal life. Uh, but uh, Bob Christopher, uh, who took over for Bob George after Bob George fell to very ill health, um, wrote a book called First Life, Then Change. <laughs> That's the name of the book, First Life, Then Change. And that, I think that is so fitting. That is what is so needed to be clarified in modern-day Christendom, especially when it comes to getting the gospel out. We can't expect lost people who have a tendency for, for sin and for the, the party life or or pursuits of, of uh, professional success or whatever they have that's motivating them and driving them and these ingrained desires that are ingrained by years of, of personality uh, conflicts and, and, and con uh, conflicts that have gone on in their life, the way they were raised, what have you. Uh, we need to get people the simple gospel, the fact that, you know, first things first, you know, don't put the cart before the horse. Um, you know, and, and like Josh McDowell is saying there, you, people hear Christianity and they think, oh, that means stop doing everything I like. That's going to impede uh, anything I have that brings me happiness or contentment or fun in this life. Uh, it, it, you know, that's a misnomer, and that's what the devil has capitalized on when it comes to uh, Christianity is confusing the, the gospel uh, and, and all the other things that should come afterwards. So, um all right, I'm done preaching. Back to you. <laughs> well, uh, I've I've talked uh, ad nauseum about uh, the error of works salvation, or sometimes called lordship salvation, and that it is damnable heresy, and and that um, we we've we've talked a little bit already today about the, the concept, the truth, that uh, uh, salvation is not based upon our earning it through religious work. It's, it's based on receiving it as a gift through faith in the Savior. And so, and that Christianity, we said, is not a religion. It's a relationship where we you put your faith in Jesus and you're promised you're going to go to heaven. Um, but sometimes people, they, they, as a matter of fact, I would say that most professing Christians, people who identify themselves as a Christian of some, some kind, um, they are not what we would call biblical Christians. They do not believe in the, the type of Christianity that you find in the Bible. Uh, they, they do think that religious works are part of a formula to go to heaven. And some of them believe that and that you, you've got to change your life before you can get saved. You've got to become religious, and that's what 
Josh McDowell is talking about here, he was under the false impression that he, he, he'd have to stop partying, he'd, he'd stop, have to stop having a good time, the things he loved to do, he'd have to give it up, so he'd have to become religious before, in order to become a Christian, and that's, that's a lie from the devil. And then, uh, then other people will say, well, no, you don't have to do that, but they expect after you've received Jesus as your Savior, received the gift of eternal life, that then your life must become religious as a result of it. And that's also a lie from, from the devil. Um, religious works are not required to get saved. Religious works are not required to keep your salvation. And religious works are not required to prove that you're authentically saved. Religious works are not required, period, by, by Christians. Jesus Christ did all the work that was needed. Uh, and we get credit for his good works, and we get credit for his payment of our debt, sin debt. So uh, that's, that's a big fallacy, and most people who are professing Christians don't understand that works are not part of a formula. Religious works plus believe in Jesus and you're saved. Now, faith alone in Christ alone. No religious works are required. We could quote, quote dozens of scriptures to prove that point if we took the time. I think you're missing something here, Luke. Uh, and it's pretty important. That kind of thinking will not lend itself to gaining you any power. You're, you're not going to be able to get followers that follow you and your teaching. Uh, you're, you're, you have to have construct and rules and teaching and organizations and, and without that how are you going to solicit funds to promulgate further followers and more power. What you're teaching here is something that you have no gain from. You're going to be left without any power here or influence. Uh, you won't end up with a building, you won't end up with a nice income, you won't end up with people uh, requesting you to write books and, and saying your name to their friends and, and relatives to join in behind you. I, I think uh, uh, you have to teach relationship and you have to tell someone how to fall in love. And it's not just a simple thing. There are rules to be followed if, and that's if, you want to be successful. Back to you. Hmm. Well, that's, that's, a, that's the truth about what a Christendom has become in the world as a whole, that it's it's, it's uh, not a relationship with Christ as your Savior, but it's a business enterprise. And so that is, truthfully, part of the reason that the religious uh, uh, leaders throughout history have tried to impose uh, religious bondage on people. Um, and But Jesus said we'd be set free from that. Um, I'll read a little further and then get your thoughts on it. Yes, let me see. Every time I was around those enthusiastic Christians, the conflict would begin. If you've ever been around happy people when you're miserable, you understand how they can bug you. They would be so happy, and I would be so miserable, that I'd literally get up and run right out of the student union. I came to the point where I'd go to bed at 10 at night and wouldn't get to sleep until 4 in the morning. I knew I had to get it off my mind before I went out of my mind. I was always open-minded, but not so open-minded that my brains would fall out. But since I was open-minded on December 19, 1959, at 8.30 p.m., during my second year at the university, I became a Christian. Somebody asked me, how do you know? I said, look, I was there. I, it changed, it's changed my life. That night I prayed. I prayed four things to establish a relationship with the resurrected living Christ. First, has, uh, first 
of living Christ, which has since transformed my life. First, I said, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Second, I confess those things in my life that aren't pleasing to you and ask you to forgive me and cleanse me. Uh, the Bible says, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Third, I said, right now, I'm the best way, the best way I know how. I open the door of my heart and life and trust you as my Savior and Lord. Take over the control of my life. Change me from the inside out. Make me the type of person you created me to be. The last thing I prayed was, thank you for coming into my life by faith. It was a faith based not uh, based not upon ignorance, but upon evidence and the facts of history and God's word. Um, I'm sure you've heard various religious people talking about their bolt of lightning. Well, after I prayed, nothing happened. I mean, nothing. And I still haven't sprouted wings. In fact, after I made that decision, I felt worse. I, I literally felt I was going to vomit. I felt sick deep down. Oh no, what have you done? What have you, you get sucked into now? I wondered, I really felt I'd gone off the deep end, and I'm sure some people think I did. I can tell you one thing, in six months to a year and a half, I found out that I hadn't gone off the deep end. My life was changed. I was in a debate with the head of the history department at a Midwestern university, and I said my life had been changed, and he interrupted me with, McDowell, are you trying to tell me, tell us that God really changed your life in the 20th century? What areas? Uh, after 45 minutes, he said, okay, that's enough. Uh, one area I told him about was my restlessness. I always had to be occupied. I had to be over at my girl's place or somewhere else in a rap session. I'd walk across the campus and my mind was like a whirlwind with conflicts bouncing around the walls. I'd sit down and tr try to study or cogitate and I couldn't. Uh, but a few months after I made that decision for Christ, a kind of mental peace developed. Don't misunderstand. I'm not talking about the absence of conflict. What I found in this relationship with Jesus wasn't so much the absence of conflict, but the ability to cope with it. I wouldn't trade that for anything in the world. Another area that started to change uh, was my bad temper. I used to blow my stack if somebody just looked at me cross-eyed. I, st I still have the scars from almost killing a man my first year in the university. My temper was such a part of me that I, I didn't consciously seek to change it. Uh, I arrived at the at the crisis of losing my temper only to find it was gone. Only once in 14 years have I lost my temper and when I, I blew it that time I made up I made up for about six years. There's another area of which I'm not proud but I mention it because I, a lot of people need, need to have the same change in their lives and I found the source of change, a relationship with the resurrected living Christ. That area is hatred. I had a lot of hatred in my life. It wasn't something outwardly manifested, but there was a kind of inward grinding. I, I was ticked off with people, with things, with issues. Like so many other people, I was insecure. Every time I met someone different from me, he became a threat to me. Uh, but I hated one man more than anyone else in the world, my father. I hated his guts. To me, he was the town alcoholic. If you're from a small town and one of your parents is an alcoholic, you know what I'm talking about. Everybody knows. My friends would come to high school and make jokes about my father being downtown. They didn't think it bothered me. I was like other people laughing on the outside, but let me tell you, I was crying on the inside. I go out in the bar barn and see my mother beaten so badly she couldn't get up, lying in the manure behind the cows. When we had friends over, I would take my father out, tie him up in the barn, and park the car up around the silo. Uh, we would tell our friends he would had to go, go somewhere. I don't think anyone could have hated anyone more than I hated my father. 
after I made that decision for Christ, maybe five months later, a love from God through Jesus Christ entered my life and was so strong it took that hatred and turned it upside down. I was able to look my father squarely in the eyes and say, Dad, I love you. And I really meant it. After some of the things I'd done, that shook him up. Uh, there's, there's a little more. I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, this, is, this is what we commonly would call a testimony that he's giving. He's, he's testifying about his, how he came to faith in Jesus and what his life has, uh, has become as, as a result of it. Uh, uh, Brother, Brother Ted, your thoughts? Yeah, the thing about this is, is um, you know, he was talking about man's natural inclination to repel against the things of God. You know, and we know that the Bible says that men love darkness rather than light. That's why they didn't come to Christ. Uh, and, you know, even here when he was on earth. And uh, but then Josh McDowell goes on and he talks about and he uses the term more than once there uh, in those paragraphs you read. Uh, talks about the living Christ. And I think that is huge. That is so key because he's not just talking about, and, and i got to be careful, pl audience, please hear me out here. He's not just, and I don't use that irreverently, but not just a Jesus who died on the cross 2,000 years ago. It's like, okay, well, you know, that's in, that's in the past. That's a historical Christ, you know, a man who died, you know, a religious rabble rouser. You know, and even if you advance more beyond that, okay, well, he's, he's the man... You know, people accept him as the Jesus who died for my sins, you know, 2,000 years ago. But to get into the fact of that he is a living Christ. He, he's the one who rose from the dead. And as Josh McDowell so pointed out there in, in his testimony of, of, of life changes, uh, a living Christ now, here in my now, in my nasty now and now, that, you know... Um, He's, he's the one, folks, that, that brings about the change in, in our circumstance, in our difficulties, you know, in, in, in our weaknesses. And uh, he's the living Christ now for everybody. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to you, Luke. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Brother Joe, what are your thoughts on this? Well, my thoughts are that uh, coming at this from where he is in, in a university setting and, and how his life changed there. Uh, teaching, learning, all these sort of things, yeah, they change people and uh, they instruct people. But even on a, a non-godly level for, for people who are not Christians, what changes you the most are relationships. And so <clears throat> whether it be good or bad, uh, Josh uh, is is talking about uh, his relationship with his father, and I can guarantee you, all the learning, all of the information, all the structures, the constructs in his life, uh, may have taken up all of his time, but the relationship with his father shaped him and changed him, and and uh, likewise, relationships with a good influence. Uh, change you in a way that no amount of learning or contemplation or uh, intelligence will ever do. And so if you are introduced to the Creator, the Lord of the universe, someone who uh, is there for you to know in such an intimate way, that relationship changes everything. And uh, it's, it's not a uh, a learning thing. It's a relationship thing. And uh, you remember back in the 70s, uh, there was all these classes uh, where in all these different philosophies where I got it. I got it. You know, it has changed my life. You could fill in the blank. But what really has changed your life is the people that you've come in contact with, both positive and negative, and the relationship that's available through Christ and you get to know the creator of the universe, that changes you in a way uh, that is indescribable to someone who's never experienced it. And so, uh, yeah, relationships, relationship with God is, is uh, 
the greatest change that anyone can ever experience. And, and it can't be taught. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I'll, I'll read. Uh, there's a little bit more he has to say about his, his life's changed. Uh, when I transferred to a private university, I was in a serious car accident. My neck in traction. I was taken home. I, I never forget uh, my father coming into my room. He asked me, son, how, how can you love a father like me? I said, dad, six months ago I despised you. Then I shared with him my conclusions about Jesus Christ. Dad, I let Christ come into my life. I can't explain it completely, but as a result of that relationship, I found the capacity to love and accept not only you, but other people just the way they are. Forty-five minutes later, one of the greatest thrills of my life occurred. Somebody in my own family, someone who knew me so well I couldn't pull the wool over his eyes, said to me, Son, if God can do in my life what I've seen him do in yours, then I want to give him the opportunity. Right there, my father prayed with me and trusted Christ. Usually the changes take place over several days, weeks or months, even a year. My life was changed in about six months to a year and a half. The life of my father was changed right before my eyes. It was as if somebody reached down and turned on a light bulb. I've never seen such a rapid change before or since. My father touched whiskey only once after that. He got it as far as his lips and that was it. I've come to one conclusion. A relationship with Jesus Christ changes lives. Uh, we've only got three paragraphs left in the book here, but let me stop there for uh, your, your thoughts on that. Uh, Brother Ted? Yeah, well, uh, you know, Jesus Christ, he's, he's the author of life, and obviously in uh, Josh McDowell's uh, dad's life, a dramatic change. Does that happen in every single person? No. Obviously from experience we know that. But uh, it just shows the potential uh, of how much, you know, if a person's willing to let God, you know, have his perfect will and his perfect way, you know, I believe it can happen. And uh, and what a testimony. What what a difference maker uh, that, uh, that, that the living Christ, once again, uh, made but he used, you know, he used Josh McDowell. I think the Bible, the Bible has a verse called "We we have this treasure, you know, Jesus Christ, in these earthen vessels, in these these clay pots that we are, to be used by God." And what a thrill it must have been for, for Josh to see that that dramatic change in his dad's life because of the living Christ and the difference that he can make. Now, back to you. All right. Well, thank you, Brother Joe. Brother Joe, I'm, I'm going to assume you got tied up on the phone, so uh, feel free to interrupt any time if you are available. I know you got a, I know you got a phone call. Um, I, I do think it is also important to say more about what what Ted just said about the changing in people's lives, because there are uh, some uh, lordship salvationists that they they try to judge whether someone is truly saved um, by how much or how little their life changes. And if, if they don't see the change in their lives, if they don't become obsessed with the Bible, attending church and preaching or whatever, or getting rid of all the sin out of their life, if they don't make, really make an effort and get this kind of change, these Lordship Salvationists judge there was not a true kin conversion. And that is also a lie from the devil. Because the uh, amount that people change is an individual thing. It's, it's unique to each person. And the rate at which people change is also unique. Uh, when, when each person is born physically from their mother's womb, we don't know how successful they're going to be in life. Some people achieve great success very at a young age. Some people succeed over slowly over a period of life. Some people, their entire lives, they're just abject failures. And yet, each person that came out of their womb 
mother's womb is truly a human being. We're all equally human. We're not equally successful. Uh, it's the same thing with spiritual success, spiritual growth and maturity. It's, it's not universal that we can say this uh, a type of change must occur in everybody. But I can say that when, you, when you're born from your mother's womb, that's being born the first time. When you put your faith in Jesus, the Bible says, and Jesus said, that we're born a second time, born spiritually. And this second birth, the, the new birth, uh, is um, um, it, it's the same kind of a thing. It, every person that's born again is equally a Christian. It's just that we don't all grow to the same heights in spiritual maturity and success. So don't make the mistake of judging someone's true Christianity based upon how much they've been able to change. <clears throat> the changes that I've made in my life, I'll tell you this, I never made one effort to change a thing. Uh, the desires in my life have changed a lot, but uh, that doesn't, that's no proof that I'm a Christian. I mean, I know people that have become very religious and they never had the proper faith in Jesus for their salvation. They, 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 they believe that they're, they've got to change their life and become religious to earn salvation. And that's, that's false Christianity. That's, that's a false gospel. And yet they're very successful at changing their lives. So the test for someone's uh, a true conversion is, is not how much their lives change. Their test, the test of their conversion is their faith. Do, are they, do they believe in themselves that if they work hard enough, they'll be able to please God and earn salvation? Or will they, will they confess, Jesus is my Savior, that I am relying on him? He is the means of my salvation. My salvation is not contingent upon how religious I, I become. And so that's the test for Christianity, not how much we, we, we change. And the change in my life, and I believe in everybody's life, is really the, the, the great change happens because the Holy Spirit living in us starts transforming us. Some of us embrace the, the promptings of the Holy Spirit, and we listen and we, 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 we conform. Uh, we, uh, we are transformed, and oftentimes we resist the Holy Spirit. Some people resist it more strongly for their whole life, and some people embrace it better. Uh, uh, Brother Ted? Yeah, uh, Luke, I think actually Joe is back, and if he wanted to comment, I'll open the floor up to him. All right, thank you, Brother Joe. Yeah, I, I, can, I can say that... Uh, I, I have some experience there. Uh, I became a Christian at a very young age, uh, just a, a child. And, but I, I knew what the gospel was, and I, I accepted Christ. Uh, and then, uh, of course, puberty hit, <laughs> and all of the challenges of, of youth uh, brought themselves towards me. And I, I, uh, I always had a relationship with the Lord. Uh, but I was not often successful in, in uh, being the person I wanted to be, uh, giving in to uh, uh, various uh, uh, sinful lifestyles. And, you know, some, sometimes I, I, you could tell I'm a Christian. You know, people look at me and say, oh, this guy must be a Christian. This guy really has it together. Or, you know, uh, gee, I wish I was like that guy. And then I went through a divorce some 20 some years ago, and uh, uh, I lived in a bottle for a while. Uh, you know, I, I chose to uh, reject the, the comfort offered through uh, my relationship with Christ in favor of an easy, quick fix to my to my pain. And uh, so, if someone would have seen me during my divorce stage, they would have never realized that I had a relationship with Christ, and I would have appeared <clears throat> to be uh, anti-Christian. Uh, the fact is, is uh, uh, God stays with us even when we're not faithful. And so uh, I think when we, when we embrace Christ and that relationship, everything else falls into place. Uh, but uh, as in a marriage, sometimes we, we choose not to embrace uh, those that we love, and uh, we go off in, in bad directions. Uh, but, you know, I, I, one person that I've known in my life, uh, 
a horrible drunk, uh, call it a disease, call it a, a, a sin, whatever you want, but a uh, few people I've known have loved God as much as he did and had such a great and close relationship with him. But uh, he certainly uh, many times witnessed the gospel uh, when he could barely walk. Uh, so it's hard to judge people, you know, based on their actions, but uh, you can base them, you can judge them based on their relationship with Christ. Uh, do they believe? And, uh, and the closer you get to Christ, the, the better you'll, you'll appear to others. Uh, but uh, it's hard to judge someone's heart just based on, on outward issues from time to time. Uh, back to you. All right, then. Uh, Brother Ted? Yep, no, that's hearty amen to that. Carry on. Uh, okay, well, we've we finished the book, uh, and um, I, I would just say then that um, um, maybe we can take not just today's study, but, but the book as a whole, and, and just take a, a, a few minutes for each of you to kind of sum up your thoughts about the study as a whole. It's been... Uh, 12 studies now. Most of them have been in two hours or close to it, so probably around 24, 21 hours of study on this. And there, we covered a lot of ground. But um, if you can, uh, concisely, sum up your thoughts on the study, and well, let's ask Brother Ted to go first. Well, I don't know about concisely, but I'll, t I'll tell you my thoughts on the book. Uh, as I said numerous times, this book, I got it when I first got saved, and I didn't, you know, I didn't hardly know the Bible at all. I didn't know much about Christianity except what I'd experienced as a kid, which wasn't much. Uh, and uh, what a what a real treat it was to go through it again the way we did and discussing it. I'd, I'd never, you know, done that with a with a book except maybe a study guide on some other stuff before. Uh, but what a treat to uh, how he laid the groundwork for why he believed what he believed and then not just what he believed but then by the end of the book it was who he believed and who that uh, you know the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ what he meant to what he meant to Josh personally uh, that was a real treat and I think you know he talked in the book earlier about changed lives of the disciples I mean, wow! What what a change that, uh, that Josh McDowell experienced, and and what a what a treat it was for him to to write down in the book the changes and why why he believed what he believed, and and who did it all, who he gave all the credit to, and that was the Lord Jesus. And I think it's a it's a pretty good example for us as we go forth, you know, in our personal evangelism efforts, whatever avenue that may be, in whatever capacity that may be, to say, hey. Yeah, if people want to know evidence, there's there's reasons to believe, but even more importantly, the foundation is who we believe in, and and what he offers, and he offers something that no other human figure in history could ever offer, and that's eternal life as a free gift, complete forgiveness of sins, and a free gift uh, of anybody who will believe in him, and then they can have the abundant life that that God wants people to have, to have true true existence, you know, as God wants people to have, for God to come and live within the person as God intended man to live. God never intended man to live without him. There was always supposed to be a communion and indwelling, uh, a, a, a perpetual, continual abiding. Uh, that's the way God designed man. He, he breathed into him, into him the breath of life. And I, I don't believe when he breathed into, into Adam the breath of life that he stayed absent. I believe God being omnipresent could, could dwell in Adam, could dwell in Eve, and dwell in anybody that wants to have a relationship with him. And that's what Christ did uh, and what Christ has done in my life. And uh, and what a blessing and, and what, a, what a blessing it was to go through the book the way we did. And I thank you for it, Luke, very much. Back to you. All right. Thank you, Brother Ted. Um, Brother Joe, what how would you sum up your thoughts on, on this book and this study? Well, uh, just like Ted, uh, I'm glad we did the study, and, and I, I am hopeful that some people will, will uh, watch the study and, and uh, 
glean uh, some gold out of out of the thoughts that we've had regarding it. It's a book that's a, a challenge. You know, I I made a uh, how to get saved video, and uh, it was viewed I, I think about 400 times on my little channel I have on uh, another channel, and I think altogether it's been viewed a couple thousand times. Uh, and that's all good, and I'm grateful that people watched it. But it's the two people who sent me emails saying that uh, my video uh, encouraged them to to uh, receive Christ. That meant everything to me. Those two views, and I, I think Josh McDowell did the same thing with this book. He he was fully aware that the great majority of people who would read this book would have already received Christ. Uh, but he wrote this book as a challenge for those few people that will pick it up and be challenged to examine the evidence and hopefully uh, enter into the body of Christ, into the family of God. And so I think that that's where, where, what we're doing here, too. We're not just fellowshipping and encouraging each other and examining ways to, to discuss the gospel with people. But we're hoping for those couple of people who will watch this or maybe even get the book because they watched one of these episodes and, and be challenged through Josh McDowell's life and his story to examine the evidence. And uh, this book uh, very succinctly and effectively shows the archaeological evidence, the historical evidence, the, the uh, testimonial evidence the eyewitness testimonies, just everything that he's brought together that culminates in his own personal testimony to challenge people to consider Christ and consider the gospel. And if one person is introduced to Christ uh, as a result of these, uh, these teachings, then uh, we've done a great job. And I hope that, that somebody will be challenged to, to pick that book up or consider what we've discussed here and and uh, and talk to God. You know, I, sometimes I often tell people that are on the fence or even a little iffy, you know, like I said earlier, you can't teach Christ. You have to introduce Christ. And I often tell people, listen, uh, try something silly. With You have hardly any faith at all that there's a God. Your, your amount of faith uh, is, a, is a grain of sand in a silo. But take that grain uh, that's in there and say, God, if you're really there, if this gospel is really true, please make yourself real to me. Sometimes that's all it takes for someone to receive eternal life. And so if, if, if a, a question's been raised, if you've been challenged even a little bit, through all of the things that I previously mentioned, uh, to, to consider Christ and the gospel. Please do. Uh, like I said, a million people can view this, but we're really wanting that one person to see it and, and enter into eternal life and, and uh, become part of the family of God. Back to you. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Uh, well, I want to thank both both of you, Brother Joe and Brother Ted, for participating with me uh, as we've read this book and discussed it together. Especially, I want to thank Josh Mudell for writing the book. Um, I guess I read the book for the first time, you know, 20, 25, 30 years ago. I don't know. I've read, I, it wasn't too long after I got saved that I discovered the book. And uh, By the way, if this book has kind of... Uh, Maybe maybe it's made all the difference in the world to you, and, and that now now you believe because you have confidence the Bible's true, and, and and now that you believe the Bible's true, you believe what Jesus and the apostles taught in the Bible, and and you you understand that salvation's a free gift that's offered to you, and now you've received it. So hallelujah, that's what happened. But some of you maybe maybe this has got you, at least got your interest started, and but you want more. Well. He has other books too, and um, 
this book here is a little paperback that's 128 pages, and look how much we got out of it. Uh, he has a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict, and then he has part two, which is called More Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And the content of those books is probably 10 times the, the amount of content as we got in this one. So if you've kind of got your appetite wet for this kind of uh, apologetics information about why we believe the Bible's true and why we believe in Jesus, and uh, that's available. You can find those books. Uh, you can also go to my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher, and, and look at my playlists, uh, Science, God, and the Bible. Uh, I have over 100 videos on there that are, are I think, very persuasive some, from some of the most uh, respected scientists uh, explaining why the Bible is scientifically correct and science supports the, our theology, doesn't debunk it. Uh, I have another playlist, Philosophy, God and the Bible, which looks at all this from a philosopher's point of view. Uh, another one titled uh, uh, Prophecies in the Bible. And the prophecies, as we've discussed in this study here, gives us a lot of confidence that the Bible is uh, this the proof that we, we, we conclude that God wrote the Bible. You know, he, it's inspired. The Bible says God breathed, that God directed the pens of the, 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 the writers. Uh, so this is the word of God. Um, so you, you can go to my YouTube channel and find a lot more, probably, probably hundreds, if not thousands of hours more about all this. But I hope that it doesn't take all that. I hope you don't remain a skeptic your entire life. Uh, I think I said earlier that skepticism is a healthy thing, but a closed mind is a tragic thing. So open your mind, even if you're a skeptic, and uh, maybe someday you'll be persuaded as we've been persuaded. I want to take just a minute and tell you that if you haven't concluded this already through this, uh, make sure you understand the good news that salvation, eternal life, uh, is, is offered to everyone. It's a free gift from Jesus Christ. Uh, on every one of my videos in the description box, I post the core doctrines of Christianity and Bible verses that support this message I'm telling you now. So I hope you will look at those verses, look at those doctrines. And uh, uh, the, the important thing to understand is that um, if you are someone that believes there is life after death and that maybe there there is a real heaven, real hell, and there is a judgment by God, and you can go to heaven or you can go to hell, and what what makes the difference? Why why do some people go to heaven and some people go to hell? If, you know, if you think this is determined by personal merit, then you're certainly on your way to hell because the Bible says no one can go to heaven based upon personal merit. We don't go to heaven because we behaved. We go to heaven because we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the first thing you need to understand. Salvation is not earned as a reward for good behavior. Salvation is received as a free gift from our Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, now, Jesus is eternal God Almighty. He came down from heaven and became a man. He said the reason he became a man was to give his life as a ransom. A ransom is a payment made to set someone free. So his death on the cross served as that payment for your ransom, to set you free from judgment and condemnation. So you should celebrate now if you understand that Jesus paid for all your sins. Everybody in the world that's ever lived, their sins have been charged against Jesus Christ on that cross. So your sins are paid in full. Now, there's one thing left to be done. Jesus paid for your sins. Now, you need to receive eternal life because you don't have it. We're not innately born uh, immortals and live forever. Uh, so we need to receive eternal life. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. So because man uh, is, is sinful, we're all doomed to die. We die once physically, and then we die the second death in the, in the lake of fire that the Bible tells us. So if you want to avoid this second death, if you want to have eternal life, you've got to receive it from Jesus Christ, and you do it in faith.
You simply believe that Jesus is the sole source of eternal life, that he alone has the ability to give it to you, and then believe that he's faithful to keep his promise. He promises if you'll trust him, you're going to heaven. Believe that he keeps his promises. And then you can confidently say, I'm certain I'm going to heaven because Jesus promised it to me. Uh, after they crucified him, he was buried. And, and then on the third day, he rose from the dead. He promised a re bodily resurrection as a sign to prove that our faith in him was justified. So put your faith in him now. Receive the gift. And then if you do, please make a comment on this video, as Brother Joe said, that even if one or two people uh, put uh, become believers just be as, as a result of, of these efforts here, and it would certainly make us happy to know that. All right. Uh, thank you for watching. Brothers, thank you for participating. And bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.